الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم والشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار ثم أما بعد Brothers and sisters in Islam, this khutbah, uh, as you could imagine, is about Ramadan because we're all waiting for the month to come. Uh, however, there are some people, some Muslims, who are going to fast this month. And the only benefit that they're going to get out of the month of Ramadan is hunger and thirst. And it is my sincere desire that through this khutbah we get beyond that as a reward for Ramadan, if you will. Our Prophet ﷺ said, "Rubba sa'imin la hadda lahu min siyamihi illa al-ju' wal atash." That perhaps there's somebody who fasts who gets nothing out of his fast except for hunger and thirst. And perhaps somebody stands, that is they're standing in prayer in the nighttime during Ramadan. They're getting nothing out of that prayer except for tiredness. That's all they're getting out of it. And so when we look at the categories of people fasting the month of Ramadan, there's one category who fasts simply because they view it as a religious duty, or perhaps worse than that, a cultural duty. They fast just because it's something that the other people in their house are doing, or they look at it as a religious obligation that they have to fulfill, and they simply want to get it over with. And so, they're planning for Ramadan, even though Ramadan is a month of fasting, their planning is all about eating. In other words, and you can, this is, the internet is full with this. How to prepare for Ramadan. Okay, what meals should we eat for suhoor? And how should we hydrate ourselves so that we can last throughout the day? Because the entire goal is to get through it. There's no, they're not looking at spiritual benefits. It's simply to get through the month. This is an obligation. I need to get it over with. And so they'll give you advice about um, when you should go to the gym and should you try to, you know, stay away from balking during Ramadan because this is a month for cutting or whatever else these people look at the month of Ramadan as being. It's, it's Ramadan modification mode. How to alter my schedule. Do the same things I'm doing, not necessarily increase in any forms of worship, perhaps not even pray on time. Worse than that, not pray, but still fast the month of Ramadan. This category fits squarely within that hadith, رُبَّ صَائِمٍ لَا حَظَّ لَهُ مِنْ صِيَامِهِ إِلَّا الْجُوَ وَالْعَطَشِ Perhaps somebody is fasting, they get nothing out of their fast except for hunger and thirst. There's another category. People who are actually striving to be better during the month of Ramadan. They have religious goals that they set for themselves 
They discuss these goals with their families. They recognize the spiritual benefit of Ramadan. They look at Ramadan as a time for self-discipline, self-control, forbearance. They see that the fact that they are able now to abstain from and refrain from those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to not only like, but to need. We need to eat, we need to drink to survive. The human race needs procreation in order to survive. These are things that, that we need, not just things that we innately crave. You stay away from them from, for a specific period of time, from Fajr until Maghrib, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure. And so they look at this time as a time to exercise self-restraint and to stay away from not only those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted for them, like food and drink, Allah prohibited them during those daytime hours, but they are in general permissible for us. So then they realize that we can also abstain from those things that Allah has made haram for us, that we don't innately crave that we may have developed a liking for. But they're impermissible, and they're haram, so we stay away from them. And this, so therefore, Ramadan for them is a time to accomplish some, some spiritual goals, to, to grow in religiosity, for lack of a better term. But the goals that they have are restricted to Ramadan itself. So, for example, they look at the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does not leave off lying and acting according to false speech or behaving ignorantly, that is, during those fasting hours, Allah has no need for him to leave off his food and his drink. That is... That is not the objective of Ramadan. And so they keep these things in mind, but for them, it stops at Ramadan. So Ramadan is a time for purification. It's a time for spirituality. It's a time to get the family together, to build those family ties, and we sit down and we, we discuss Islam and we, all of these nice things. But it stops at Ramadan. They don't look at Ramadan as a time of permanent change. Ramadan is a time to grow, and then we just go back to doing our normal thing after the month of Ramadan. There's another category. And this is the category that I hope to shed some light on, that I hope we, we strive for. And that is the category of those who look at Ramadan differently. They look at Ramadan as a time to mend their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to fix the things that they have been doing wrong. It's a time for sincere and serious reflection and self-examination. It's a time that they use to promote not only increasing in good, but developing good habits. And as any you know, mental health professional will tell you, the development of a habit is usually something that someone can do in a three-week period. And Ramadan, as we know, is a month. So for example, if you can fast for 30 days straight, can you not then fast every Monday of the year, for example? If you can pray for 30 nights straight, for an hour at a time, sometimes longer than that, sometimes a little shorter. Can you not develop that into a habit that you take beyond the month of Ramadan? And so Ramadan is not simply for them a time to grow in spirituality and trying to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but a time to create habits that go with them beyond the month of Ramadan. If you, if you look at the hadith of the Prophet, Ibn Abbas, 
said about the Prophet ﷺ that he was the most generous of people. When? In Ramadan only? No. The Prophet ﷺ was generous year-round. But he was the most generous of all yeah, for himself during the month of Ramadan. So his, his generosity increased in the month of Ramadan. But then after Ramadan, he didn't bottom out. He was still the most generous of all of the people. And so Ramadan was a time to increase, build the habit, and then continue with that habit after the month of Ramadan. So it, it is, again, this category that I want to shed some light on. Because many of us, though we hear the ayat and we hear you know, what the objective of Ramadan is, many of us don't put that into concrete terms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyam, kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum, la'allakum tattakoon. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is saying, O oh, you who believe, talking to the Muslims, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for the nations prior to you. All of the prophets taught their people to fast. It doesn't mean that they with or they upheld that fasting. Till today, Catholics fast. Till today, Jews fast. However, is their fast the way that it was prescribed by Moses? Is it the way that it was prescribed by Isa alayhi salatu wasalam? The fact that Catholics, for example, abstain from meat on Ash Wednesday, and they only eat one meal every Friday leading up until Easter for them, for that particular time. That is what they call fasting. That is their version of fasting. Is that what Jesus prescribed for them? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. But this seems to have come out of teachings of the church, not teachings of Christ himself, alayhi salatu was the, the point is here that fasting was prescribed by all of the prophets. It is part of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's deen. It is from those mothers of worship, as they call them, those great acts of worship, like prayer and like giving zakat and so on. It was prescribed for you as it was prescribed for the people before you so that you achieve taqwa. So that you achieve taqwa. Not so that you get hungry and thirsty. Not so that you can say, oh, now I understand and I can empathize with people who don't eat on a daily basis. Yes, this is one of the results that comes about from Ramadan, but this is not the objective of your fast of Ramadan. The objective of your fast is to attain taqwa. We all know that. We hear that on an annual basis. But what does taqwa look like? What does it look like? Have you ever picked up the Quran? Do you think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell you that the goal of fasting is taqwa and then not talk about taqwa in the Quran? Have you picked up the Quran and said to yourself, let me read the Quran, with the sole intention now of looking at the characteristics of the muttaqin, those people who have taqwa. Because the only way you're going to be able to measure yourself, do you have taqwa or not, where are you falling short in the qualities of the people of taqwa is to know what they are. You cannot reach a goal if you don't know how to define that goal. It's really that simple. And many people, many Muslims, they go year in, year out, and not take the time to look at what it means to be from the muttaqin. And so inshallah ta'ala, what we're going to look at, very briefly, a few ayahs from the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the muttaqin. Because then we can measure ourselves. Subhanallah, look at it as criteria. You know, most of us today, for some reason or another, we have to create a password. Whether it's for your, your email account, whether it's for a, a bill that you have to pay or whatever. You have to create a password, right? On the side, they give you criteria for that password. And then they put the, the bar underneath. So as you start typing in your password, they tell you whether it's weak or medium strength or strong. And on the side, it says, oh, it has to have a capital letter, or it has to have this amount of numbers in it, this many characters, uh, should have a sign, symbol in there, or something like that. These are the criteria for you to have a strong password. If you don't, you still have a password, but it's going to be weak, and somebody can come hacking. And it's the same 
way with taqwa. You have criteria that you have to fulfill. If you don't fulfill those criteria, it's not to say you won't have any taqwa. But your taqwa is going to be weak and you'll be hacked by shaitan. Period. So, we have to look at these criteria so that we can understand, are we up to speed or not? So, the first thing, when you open the Qur'an, you read Surah Al-Fatiha, you switch to the next page, and there's Surah Al-Baqarah. And Allah Azza wa Jal starts out the Qur'an by explaining to us the characteristics of the muttaqin. Alif Lam Meem, Dalika Al-Kitabu, La Rayba Fi. Hudan Lil Muttaqin. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, Alif Lam Meem, that is the book about which there is no doubt. It is Huda, it is guidance for the people of Taqwa. Who are they? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is going to tell us, Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقَنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ They are those who believe in the unseen. That is, they have unshakable faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because He is the greatest of the unseen. They have unshakable faith in the last day. They believe in Allah's decree. They believe in His angels, His messengers, His books. And they don't stop at some nominal belief. But they push themselves to learn more so that they have true faith in the unseen, true belief in the unseen. Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghayb. That is the first quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the people of taqwa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, وَيُقِيمُونَ salah." They establish the salah. What does establish the salah mean? Pray when they want? It means that Allah has prescribed for us times to pray and you pray during those times. Not only do you pray during those times, you pray during those times all the time. And not only that, but you push yourself to pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed. Not just ex externally, but also internally. That you're there when you're praying. Not that you're doing business or you're running your account books or you're treating a patient or whatever else you might be doing in your head but that you are there when you pray. That is part of establishing the salat. If you do not do that, your level of taqwa is commensurate with that. You have, to, you have to understand it. It's proportionate to your belief in the unseen. Your level of taqwa is proportionate to your establishing the prayer. Ask yourself, where were you this morning for Fajr? Where were you? Do you live within distance of a masjid, did you pray at a masjid this morning for Fajr? Did you pray Fajr this morning? Did you pray on time? We, we can't just let these things slip through the cracks and think that we got everything we're supposed to get out of fasting. Fasting is not simply abstaining from food and drink. What you get from that is hunger and thirst. That's not why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribed the fasting. It is that abstaining from food and drink that allows us to think a little bit more about the other things in life. We starve that flesh, you starve your ego, and now you can nourish your soul. You can think a little bit more about the other part of you that gets neglected so much in the rest of the year. And from what we have given them, what we have provided for them, they spend. Meaning that they spend to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, many of the men in our community, they take care of their families. They spend, they don't leave their children neglected. They don't leave their wives neglected. But are they doing it for Allah? Or is it because of cultural norms? Why, why are you spending? Do you spend more money on your cable and internet than you do to support your masjid? Is that the case? Because these masajid that you come to, that you benefit from its services, they, they're not supported by public dollars. If the Muslims don't take care of these masjids, nobody else is. Do you spend for Allah's cause? You can measure yourself. If you're stingy, you can't have that level of taqwa. Your, your, your taqwa is proportionate to your spending for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what Ramadan is about. Ramadan is about attaining taqwa. There are many other verses in the Qur'an 
that highlight and emphasize these same points. But due to the time factor that we have in a khutbah, they can't all be addressed. But recognize that from the characteristics of the muttaqeen, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, this is not even from the sunnah of the Prophet it's right there in the Quran, accessible to every Muslim. And if you read the Quran, you'll see these sifat, or these characteristics. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, describes the muttaqeen, the people of taqwa, as those who spend at times of adversity and prosperity. Not just when things are going well, but even when things get a little tight. Even when you took a hit and you lost some money, you still give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that is from the qualities of the people of taqwa. That you control your anger. If you're somebody that turns into a firecracker the minute you get angry, you scream. And, and don't test it with the brothers in the masjid. Don't test it in your social spheres. Everybody can front at work. Everybody can be somebody they're not when they're in the masjid. Test yourself in your home. The minute something goes wrong, do you start screaming at people? If something doesn't go your way, you have to test yourself. Controlling your anger is from the characteristics of the people of Tukwa. And if you don't do so, and this is how we really have to understand, if you don't have that characteristic, your taqwa is deficient. That means that during the month of Ramadan, you need to work on that, overcome that, and implement it in your life. Pardoning people, forgiving them for the wrong that they've done to you, especially if you don't assume that they are going to do it to someone else. This is from the characteristics of the people of Taqwa. And there are many other characteristics that obviously cannot be addressed at this particular time. However, what we'll say is that you have to use this month of Ramadan. If we're going to get the most out of our fast, then we have to be from those people who strive to achieve the qualities of the people of Taqwa. Not simply that we do it during the month of Ramadan, but that we build those habits that will help us be better people because you can change. And you can maintain that change even after the month of Ramadan. Let the Ramadan of this year, of 2018, be the Ramadan where you set a goal for yourself. For example, you set that goal of fasting after Ramadan, that you fast the, the Monday every week. If that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes easy for you. And then let the Ramadan of 2018 be the Ramadan that changed your life in that way. If it is the time when now you pray every night, you pray at least with her. Before you go to sleep, if you think that you're not going to be able to wake up, then let it be the, the Ramadan where you have created that permanent change in your, in your life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to witness the month of Ramadan and be from amongst the people of Taqwa. Aqulu qawli adha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al-ghafuru rahim. الحمد لله الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له إقرارا به وتوحيدا وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وسلم تسليما مزيدا أما بعد There are common errors that are made in the month of Ramadan and they need to be avoided from the onset. They need to be part of your planning uh, during the month of Ramadan so that you don't fall into these errors, inshallah ta'ala. The, the first of them that I'm going to mention, and I won't mention too many, but enough for you to grasp on. Number one. Big iftars during the last 10 nights of Ramadan. What happens at these iftars? We invite somebody over. We invite somebody over to the house. The families come over. We use it as a time not to gain the reward of feeding a fasting person, but to show off 
how much and how great of a cook our spouses are. We want them to see the various types of food that they can cook, that they've spent the entire day making instead of reading the Quran and doing other things. They've spent their entire day in the kitchen, and we want to be able to show everybody this. And then we come, and we eat, and then we eat some more. And then we pray Maghrib, and we eat some more. And then we talk. And then we look at our clocks and we say, oh, subhanAllah, it's getting late. Oh, we need... And then you come to the masjid late for Isha. And then you miss part of Tarawih. All because we needed to get together and socialize, even though any of those nights might be Laylatul Qadr. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laylatul Qadr khayru min alfi shahr. That Laylatul Qadr is superior to, is better than, a thousand months. More than 83 years of worship. Now I want you to think about this. A person who prays Isha in Jama'ah is like he prayed half the night. The Prophet ﷺ said. The person who prays Fajr in Jama'ah is like they prayed the other half of the night. So just by praying Isha and Fajr. Then it's like you prayed the entire night. Whoever prays with his Imam until he's done praying, that is the night prayer, tarawih. Then it's like he prayed the entire night. So in one night, it's like you prayed two nights in full. The reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah azza wa jal is kareem, he's generous, and he's most generous during Laylatul Qadr. Look at this. Because not only is your deeds, all of your deeds are multiplied 10 times to 700 times over. So let's just take the minimum. Two nights is like 20 nights Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you for, but not just that. It's not like you just pray 20 nights. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to reward you if it's Laylatul Qadr as if it was for 83 some odd years plus. So it's like you pray 20 nights times a thousand months and even more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's bounty is endless, but we spend that time eating, stuffing our faces and talking to people. That's a mistake. That's a mistake. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is extending his generosity to us. And it's like we're saying, I'm good. I don't need it. Oh, we have to take advantage of that time. It's not a time for socializing. Which is why the Prophet sallallahu did what in the last 10 nights? He made i'tikaf, stay away from the people. That's not to say that that's something that you have to do. But you do have to cut down on, on the socializing. The second thing is that some people come to the masjid for social meetups. So while other people are praying, they are talking, they are giggling, they are doing whatever, as if the masjid was made to hang out in. And unfortunately, this is especially common on the other side of the masjid. So people come to the masjid to talk. This is a house of worship. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited us from raising our voices in recitation of the Qur'an if it was going to cause a distraction and nuisance to the people who are praying. That's if you're reading the Qur'an in an audible voice. What about if you're talking and giggling while other people are trying to worship Allah? Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The masjid is not for that. And this is a big mistake that happens in many of our masajid. The third and final thing that I'll mention in terms of common errors that occurred during the month of Ramadan is that some people cannot fast for a legitimate reason. Either they are sick, a woman is experiencing her monthly cycle, or whatever else might be going on, that there's a legitimate reason for them not to fast. That does not mean that the blessings of Ramadan are not extended to you. You can still feed someone who was fasting. You can help them break their fast. And for that, you get the reward of that fasting person, as the Prophet ﷺ informed us. You can still rest, recite the Qur'an. And for those of you who have not memorized enough of the Qur'an, that, that you can listen to the Qur'an and repeat after what you hear. You can read tafsir of the Qur'an. Even if you're not in a state of purification where you would be able to touch the Qur'an, you can still be engaged 
in the recitation of the Qur'an and understanding the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can still make a lot of dua. The, door, the doors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are open. And Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she went to the Prophet sallallahu in those last ten nights and said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, if we know what night is Laylatul Qadr. She didn't say, what do we do, O oh, Messenger of Allah? She said, what should we say? The Prophet sallallahu said, say. Allahumma inna ka'afuun tuhibbul afwa fa'afu anni. Oh Allah, you are the partner. You love pardoning, so pardon me. Right? The point here is that dua is at all times. The Prophet sallallahu would remember Allah when he was standing, when he was sitting, when he was laying down, in all types of scenarios. So we don't stop making dua. The point is that even if you don't fast for whatever legitimate excuse that you have in Islam, you can still benefit from the blessings of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to witness the month of Ramadan and to fast its days with sincere faith and seeking his reward. We ask him subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us to stand its nights in sincere faith and seeking his reward. ربنا لا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وأقم الصلاة